Okay, so uh, my name is Simon. I work for Shopify. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about Docker. And I think I'm going to start by talking about what this talk is not about. This is not a talk trying to brainwash you into using Docker. Uh, it's not a talk about how great Docker is, but rather a talk about all the challenges that it brings with you once you recognize some of the valuable things that containers can, can bring to you, uh, to your organization. Um, I'll also be using Docker and containers kind of interchangeably. Uh, Docker has become sort of the Kleenex of containers. And um, so this is really a talk about a deployment story that we had where we spent about six months getting Docker into production. And uh, we've been operating it in production for about a year now. And sort of the lessons we've learned, all the mistakes that we've made putting it into production, and some of the advice that I can give based on what we have learned. So just, just a little bit about Shopify first. Uh, I think this is important just to keep in the back of our head the scale that we are at, because if you're larger than us, you're going to run into more problems than we ran into. And if you're smaller than us, you're going to run into fewer problems. Um, Shopify is a commerce platform. We, if, you're doing, if you want to do any kind of commerce, we try to be your guy. Um, we kind of provide a CMS for online stores. We also do kind of a point of sale solution, and Facebook, and multiple other, other channels. Um, we were able to run about 10,000 RPS um, and 10,000 orders per minute. And um, we have about 300 million visitors per month, which really puts us up there aggregated with some of the, um, some of the bigger, bigger players like eBay and Apple and, and so on. Um, we're running about 4,000 containers across two data centers. We're in co-located um, data centers and running on our own uh, bare metal hardware. So we started looking at Docker and all of these, these things that Docker enables about two years ago now. And really, we were set down about three, three people, with uh, three to four people, with the goal of trying to make Shopify a more enjoyable place to solve commerce problems. Really, we wanted to be the best place in the world to solve commerce problems down the line so that if, you're, if you want to do a commerce product um, and you work at Shopify, that should be really easy. We should have a platform that really fosters creativity, uh, continuous integration, and just makes the platform concern really, really minimal. Um, we wanted to be able to do things like running CI in less than five minutes, going, deploying in less than five minutes, um, give our developers more control, um, one of the really cool things that, that Docker provides is, is an abstraction where it allows your developers to own what is inside of the container and your platform team, everything that revolves around the container. And this gives a really, really clear line in the sand between what your application developers own and what your platform team owns. And this really gives your developers more control because they don't have to care about all the infrastructure parts. They just have to care about building a container. And we really, really liked that abstraction that it provided and the fact that it meant that our product teams could just operate as entities that just deliver, delivered a container. And my team would take care of distributing that and scaling that container. Um, and another thing that's, that's um, actually, no. And kind of in extension of that, one of the, one of the interesting things that hap that's happened in the past 10 years or so is that infrastructure as a service has become a pretty, um, pretty standard thing. EC2 launched um, quite a few years ago now. Um, and as one of the first providers really provided infrastructure as a service, you could click a button, and you would have a server that you are now able to SSH into. You could automate this. You could do, do things on top of APIs and so on. And some people saw that that abstraction sits at, at a level like a little bit too low. And they started building these platforms as a service. And platforms as a service is really the other extreme, where instead of providing servers and or infrastructure as a service, you're trying to provide services as a service. So this is things like instead of a button and you get a, a server, you click a button and you have a MySQL cluster. You click a button, you have a memcache cluster, a Redis cluster, and so on. Heroku is a great example of that, where you have sort of like an app store where different vendors can pitch in and get their infrastructure to run um, it for your application and easily connect to it. The problem, though, is that these are, these are two, two extremes. One is an extreme in the low-level direction and the other in the high-level direction. If you want to do something really large and custom on something like Heroku in a pass, you have the problem that you can't really customize too much. And when you start customizing, the abstraction starts to feel wrong, and it gets a little awkward. 
So really where containers and the patterns that containers allow us to do is it sits at a really, really cool level just between the infrastructure as a service and the platform as a service. Where again, what your developers and what your company is giving to the, uh, to the companies that are, that are operating your infrastructure or uh, the teams within your organization that's operating your infrastructure, you give that team your container and they run it. You don't have to ask someone on your operations team to install some kind of package for you because now you need to um, communicate with memcache and you need the memcache C headers and so on to build your library. Uh, you don't have to do that anymore. You can just own that and de the developers own that entire container and send it off. It also has great benefits because it means that the developers can now do that in development and so on. So these are really the patterns that the container mythology allows you to do. Um, and the rest of this talk is really about how difficult that is. So we've been running Docker in production for our main application for about a year. Now Shopify is a Ruby on Rails application. It's, it's basically one big uh, monolith that we have our engineers work on. And getting to production with Docker was intensely challenging. Um, there's so many problems out there that not a lot of people are talking about because Docker is not seeing a lot of scale currently. And many of these things, frankly, haven't gotten much easier. Um, but really, what we're trying to do is not make, we're, obviously, we're not trying to make things worse in the, in the short term. But what we're really interested in is building a really interesting platform going forward. We're trying to enable and set ourselves up for success in the future by embedding the knowledge into the organization of what are containers and how can we build this, this CAS as we move forward. And the way that the community has approached this is kind of this adoption, adoption triad, where Docker, um, Docker and not any of the other containerization technologies like LXC really managed to appeal to developers. For somehow, Docker found just a sweet spot to get developers interested in this stuff that's much more of a sysadmin concern when you think about it. Containerization technologies have been around for a really, really long time. If you have that one friend who's seen the light and talks about Solaris all the time, they'd, they'd be telling you about how they've been doing this for decades uh, or something along those lines. In Linux, um, support for uh, containerization and isolation of processes um, is really somewhat recent. I think some of the first uh, pioneering work was done by um, companies like Google, who were trying to push patches into the kernel. Uh, OpenVZ uh, is another project that was trying to do this, um, and really do this at the kernel level instead of the virtualization level like um, VMs and so on. So what Docker has really done is they've built a containerization technology around on top of these Linux primitives that are now in the kernel and on most of the kernels that you are running today and made them, them accessible. And they marketed it extensively for developers to start with. You, um, to solve the development and CI challenges that a lot of companies are having, like if, you ha if you're running a lot of services at once and they need to communicate with each other, um, it's one, it's really hard to deploy it, but it's also, increasingly hard to develop with it and test with it. If you, want to ha if you have two services, A and B, and A talks to B, how do you write tests on top of that? And how do you debug issues in the when, when these two components are interacting with each other? And that's one of the, I think that's one of the sweet spots where, uh, where developers really saw the appeal because it, it enabled them to write more services and so on. That also, that's also not a silver bullet, just like Docker. And microservices and these kind of architectures carries a lot of problems with them as well. But a lot of companies do have smaller, uh, smaller services that do talk to each other uh, to some extent. At Shopify, we don't really have that. We have one big application. We do have data stores and a few services that it talks to here and there, but it is essentially a monolith architecture at this point. So the second step in, in the adoption of Docker is really the production step. A lot of companies have started adopting Docker in CI and development environment, but very, very few have gotten to the point where they actually push it into production. And even more scary is the fact that everyone is obsessing over this idea of having your internal platform as a service, CAS, or whatever you want to call it. And this is where, this is where all, the, the, all the vendors are going. Um, that's what people, people are building, but they're really st missing that production step, which means that Docker is not getting very much exposure to production for the reasons that people are uh, trying to build these very, very complicated stacks that they're only running very few um, applications on, 
And um, not very many people are deploying Docker in isolation. And so I, I, when people ask me like what, how, how people should adopt uh, Docker and what, in which order, that's really the order I recommend. S uh, development CI, then production, and then CAS. Um, and that's because we did it in reverse and failed miserably. In uh, January to, to June of, of, of 2014, we, um, we, we started getting serious about building out our, our Docker infrastructure. And we started out with this grand vision of we want this CAS. We want to build this PaaS so that all of our developers click buttons, they get their uh, data stores, and it's really easy to deploy. You just do a Docker push, and it's in production. We build sliders and buttons for them, and it's all good. And we had a very, very naive thought in retrospect that we could just go and build that. And there are a lot of companies out there who are offering solutions to build these things out of the box, uh, but most of it doesn't work. And it didn't really work back then especially not at our scale, where we do have very, very aggressive uptime requirements, we can't just take a completely new stack and put our application on it. Uh, unfortunately, that took us almost half a year to really realize. The good part was, though, that we spend a lot of time also containerizing Shopify. And you can't, because you can't just take an application and shove it into a container, uh, there's really a lot of brickwork that's involved in making that happen. And I'll talk a bit more about that in, um, uh, in a second. And then in July, we, um, July, June, really, we, we were starting to get tired of playing around with all these orchestration technologies. We couldn't get them to work. It was a nightmare to debug, and we could not by any means ship this sustainab sustainably to production. So what we did was we sat down and decided that we're going to ship something, and that something is going to be just containers, and we will ship that as the only change. Everything else still stays the same. We've been using Chef for configuration management, so we're going to use that to orchestrate containers, not any fancy distributed orchestration. Um, we're going to keep using Run It for uh, monitoring the containers and restarting them when they fail and this stuff, and really stick with all the boring old stuff. And this, this ended up working, and um, well, it, it didn't really work. Um, so we put this into production in July 14, and the next couple of, couple of, couple of months were pretty miserable. And really, we ended up with a stack that was probably worse than what we had before. We spent a lot of time firefighting uh, different things. Um, we had soft kernel lockups because we were running on uh, edgy Linux kernels. Uh, the APIs are not extremely stable at this point. Um, and the fires kind of eased out after a couple of, a couple of months. And uh, then we started preparing for the holidays. Because we are an e-commerce platform, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, huge events for us. So that really drained all our resources, and we didn't really work on features for a little while. So for about half a year, we had a stack that was worse than what we had before, and we leveraged none of the, none of the good things about Docker, uh, but only really the bad parts. So in, in January, May, is, and, and this year, we've, we've finally started, started really using our knowledge of Docker and our experience with it and we cut our deploy time from about 15 minutes down to three minutes. We got our CI to run in five minutes instead of 15 minutes. And we're continuing now to sort of harvest all of these longer term um, goals that we had to leverage Docker um, with, the, with the short term pain of, of last year. So once again, I do not recommend this approach. And I'll talk a bit more about what I recommend. And another important, important distinction, I think, is, is be between greenfield and, and legacy deployments of Docker. And there are many, many dim dimensions of different kinds of deployment strategies that you can choose to deploy Docker. And so greenfield is the one that, that most of the industry seems concerned with right now. Uh, when I talk to a lot of uh, larger banks, uh, large, very traditional companies with development firms, um, they kind of have a development division split in two. One half is working on the money-making applications written in COBOL, probably emulating chips uh, like um, architecture, IBM architectures from the 70s to run their scary, scary applications that no one touches. And um, they, the other part of that development division is sort of the growth department. These are, these are developers working on new products, uh, rapid iteration, and um, sort of the, the growth developers. And, what, what these companies are looking, uh, looking and going to Docker for is really having a platform that enables these developers to, to work quickly, iterate quickly, get products out quickly, and so on. The other approach um, 
is, is more al along the lines of what we did, which is really trying to evolve your old stack into something new. So really what we're trying to do is evolve the, sh the platform that Shopify is running in on now into that platform that we want uh, a long time from now, which is, which is a little bit different from the other approach where you keep running your old stuff and then you have your, your completely new application. So I think it's important to make that distinction before you get started of are we going to do a greenfield deployment of Docker or, or, or are we going with a pro an approach trying to move our existing stack? And of course, this is extremely, um, this depends a lot on what your organization looks like now. If you are running emulated IBM chipsets from the 70s, then maybe, maybe the legacy approach is not the way to go. Uh, but if you are running a somewhat modern stack, this might be a good way to go. The other problem is that, for, for at least going the legacy approach, is that most of the vendors nowadays are very, very focused on the greenfield approach. It's really fun to build your own CAS, and you see people building their own proxies, people are building, like, there are more raft implementations out there for service discovery now than I can count. Um, people are doing a lot of different things and really re-implementing the same thing over and over again with very, very few agreed upon components that everyone's using. And then you have companies like us who are trying to evolve a current stack into a Dockerized one, into a containerized stack, who are more focused on evolving a platform, but we can't take any of the components from these greenfield companies that are exist now tens, if not over a hundred of, who are trying to give you this CAS out of a box. And th this, this kind of revolves around a, um, a chicken and egg problem because if you're trying to build a stable CAS but nobody can actually take your stuff to production, at least at large scale, then your, um, your road to production is going to be really, really long, and especially for, for these companies. So really what I'm hoping that I'll see is more vendors realizing that, um, that and building components that you can kind of grow, uh, grow into. So you can pick a component, use it for some, some amount of, um, of functionality, like pick out a service discovery layer from one solution, and then pick another one of their components, and then slowly evolve into the stack that you, that you want. Because that's how, that's how you involve production infrastructure. You can't just take a big, completely new thing and put your old thing on it. You can put new things on it, but not old things. So really what all these, all, these, all these cast providers and vendors and all the people out there developing this software have fortunately agreed on one thing. And that one thing is Docker. And really the, the biggest value that Docker is bringing at this point is probably that people have finally agreed on one thing. And, but everything else just kind of remains a mystery and people keep re-implementing the same things. So because of this, the production maturity of Docker and the surrounding, the surrounding components really isn't there yet. But for development and for CI, there's, there's, I think, a lot of benefits to be had currently, especially if you have multiple services that are communicating with each other and you run into the scenarios, as I described before, where you want to run integration tests across multiple, multiple applications. Um, you want to have your development teams have pretty predictable environments where you can run multiple applications at the same time without getting into a crazy dependency hell. Uh, for example, you might have two services that are running different versions of Ruby or Python or whatever, and doing that with something like Vagrant is, is really difficult. Uh, it might require having multiple VMs if you want complete isolations, very, very interesting cookbooks, or other strange, um, strange and really fragile ways of, of building this out. So I think there, and kind of every team collaborating around containers and providing sort of a golden image for their application for other developers to use and to communicate with their apps, uh, doesn't really leak the abstraction of the application because you're still communicating with the API, but um, actually provides some real benefit now. So I've tried to like, kind of like sum up the, the, the first parts of, of this talk in, in, in sort of an adoption matrix. Um, and this, this is probably a little bit confusing, but what I, um, this work, yeah. So out here we have sort of the different use cases for, for Docker. Um, preparation, which means kind of preparing your, your application for, for Docker, which I'll talk um, about for basically the rest of this talk. Then there's using Docker in a development environment. 
and using it in a CI environment, production environment, and um, the whole CAS platform. And then kind of your architecture here. If you're uh, somewhat of a monolithic app, there really aren't that many benefits to be, to be had from Docker. Uh, Five, five is best here, but if you are doing multiple services, I think that there are a lot of things to gain from preparing your stack for containers and preparing it for, um, to leverage this, this technology. And especially in sort of a, a CI environment, it's, it's really great that you can write, finally write integration tests across apps, which is something that is, is, is really an unknown field currently. Um, production and CAS is still somewhat of a question. The production tools just aren't really there. In, from, from what I've seen. It's definitely getting better, and it's a lot better than, than from when we went into production um, uh, some time ago. And you can notice here that we're somewhat monolithic, so I definitely do not recommend what we did, which is go into production with Docker with somewhat of a monolithic architecture. It's, it's basically a, a waste of time at this point. I do hope that, it, that it's getting better and the, mat the maturity of the platform evolves enough that even in that case, it does bring a lot of benefits. But at this point, the pros just really do not outweigh the cons for that kind of infrastructure. The last thing down here, which is kind of awkwardly placed, is, is the security of containers. And um, I think the CTO of Joyent, uh, Brian C., made, made a really good point uh, about that, where in Linux, they're really trying to iterate, their, their iterate to security. Whereas in things like Solaris, again, the people who have seen the light, um, they architected for security right off the bat and have achieved world-class security at this, at this point to a level where um, um, it is way, way beyond what Linux has. So what they've done is Linux is they've kind of carried out all the functionality, and now they're trying to make it secure. And that's just not really how it works. That's kind of like blacklist versus whitelist. Um, so that's, that is one of my concerns. For, for, a lot of for a lot of people who are running a, a, a CAS or a PaaS internally, it doesn't matter too much um, because as long as you don't rely on these primitives. Um, but for people who are doing, um, who are writing CAS like uh, Google, Amazon, and so on, who are now providing container services, this is a big deal because it means that they still have to run VMs underneath like Sen or VMware or whatever uh, because they can't rely on the security of the container. So really you're running a VM and then a container inside of it, which is two, two isolation layers. And the virtualization performance nowadays is good, but it's still not amazing. And, and for some applications, this really rules out this approach still. So, the rest of this talk is, is basically about what kind of the roadmap that I wish that someone had handed us and explained to us before we went into production. It's somewhat, it's somewhat biased towards a legacy stack and, and, and our, our stack, but I think that there are a lot of lessons be, to be learned here from uh, whatever you're looking at or even if you're looking at this next year. And again, many people start kind of in reverse and then go all the way up. And uh, we certainly did, which was a, a big mistake. And we ended up wasting a lot of time from that. And um, so the first stage here is, is the exploration stage. And that basically means that you have a, a bunch of developers sit down, spend some time with containers, de develop a feel for what kind of power can we harvest from this, and is it really worth our time? Um, the next one is about uh, preparing your application. I'll go into depth with these steps in a second. Uh, preparing your application, preparing um, the patterns within your organization to, to allow for this stuff. And the third one is where you actually finally start um, looking at containers, actually using them in development or CI or in production. And then in the fourth one is the grand vision that everyone is looking towards, is that they can start building these CAS, these buttons, and the levers, and so on. Um, but don't start there. And don't try to parallelize across these stages. Don't try to be refactoring application while you're putting it into containers and take shortcuts. So the first stage is, is, the, is the exploration stage. And what you're trying to do in the exploration stage is really s get the knowledge internally of what, what, would it take, what would it take to put some of our applications within uh, containers. Some very modern applications are actually pretty much ready to just be put in a container, um, which is great if, they, if they're looking for solutions like this for CI and development. Um, but for many, this will be uh, like a multi-month, half, if not even a full year for some of their application to make this transition and develop all the software that's compatible with whatever they have. So really, it's about getting a good understanding of how containers work. This means understanding Linux namespaces in depth, 
which is what Docker containers build on top of, uh, kind of the kernel API for isolating processes. Um, the man pages are basically the only documentation, and kind of speaking to the immaturity of this stuff, um, I had to dig out a lot of it from like the Linux kernel uh, manual uh, mailing list where they're discussing man pages because they weren't actually in the Linux distribution yet. Um, you should be studying companies and their use cases and what they're doing with Docker and whether that that's something that you're excited about and fits into what you're trying to accomplish. C groups is the same thing. C groups has been around for for quite a while to um, work done by Google many many years ago to isolate processes from each other. It's also really under really important to understand. Um, and then really developing a feel for containers. What, what's right to do in a container? What's not right? Uh, you shouldn't be putting a ton of state in your container. You probably shouldn't be running Chef in your container. And you should probably only be running one or two processes per container, and so on. Just kind of get that feel. And it's important to not get stuck or starstruck. And starstruck here really means that you get obsessed with this vision of building out a pass or a cast for your company, because that's a much, much, much longer project. You're, taking the very, very first small steps toward this, but you really can't step the, the next two stages to get there. And in this stage, I really encourage rapid prototyping, like trying out some of the ideas you have to figure out if your um, mental model of Docker really fits what you're actually able to do. Get, get a feel for the software out there. And it's really important that when you're done with all this, you throw it all away. Don't try to develop any, any of this into production code. Just throw it away and move on to the next stage. So once, you, once you've explored it and you've gotten some, some level of, of confidence and, um, and, and knowledge of Docker within your organization, it means that you can start making decisions uh, based on future architecture on whether that will fit in a containerized world. Again, you're trying to set yourself up for success because containers in the future are going to be inevitable to escape. How long that will take, we don't quite know. But, in the preparation stage, you're really trying to evolve some of your current stack into adopting some of the patterns that are uh, compatible with running in containers. And I'll get to a few examples. Really, the mindset that you have to adopt and that you, got, that you should have hopefully gotten out of the first stage is that you need to adapt a mindset of immutable infrastructure. This means being able to um, Build, build something and then not do any online changes to it, but build it from scratch again or from some kind of caching infrastructure. So you really need to be thinking of your application as somewhat of a static binary that you're shipping around and running. And so some of the, some of the very common things that, that people have to address to fix this problem um, is something like secrets. I'll go into depth with that uh, just after this slide. And then there's logs. A lot of people are, are using vendors like Splunk and so on, which, which don't work really well with, with containers out of the box. There's um, some people who are using IP, doing IPC between processes on the same node. Um, and that really has to be done via network and not via, via like file IO or uh, sys5 shared, shared namespaces and stuff like that. Um, Really, really, you need to be doing all of this stuff, all of the communication with external things over the network. Uh, one example we had was um, all of our web traffic went into an Nginx on every node and then um, sent down to the web servers over a Unix domain socket. But with containers, that doesn't really work, um, and which is just one of the many rabbit holes because it turns out Unix domain sockets and TCP sockets act differently when you when you have like a listen backlog um, on on the socket. So there's an incredible amount of, of rabbit holes to get into here. And really, the, uh, the important part is just starting to modernize your stack towards this, um, um, towards something that can eventually be put in containers. That might not be this year, but it is an, imp an important R&D effort to do if you do recognize the value of containers down the line. There's a, there's a um, kind of a paradigm or uh, a website called 12 Factor, which kind of lists out 12 principles of what a modern application should look like. I think some of them are a little bit outdated in terms of Docker, but it's really a great start to look at some of these for, for what you should be doing. And there's a ton of other things like uh, making your deploys more immutable. Uh, you should be able to scale scaling your application by adding new containers is a great place to be in, too, before containerizing it. But really, this depends a lot on your environment. And this is why you have the first stage where you can figure out what kind of things that you need to change to get to the second one. And again, it's really just as much about what it's not. 
in that stage, you're not trying to do containers. You're not trying to change your routing layer. You're not trying to switch to some um, cool new Linux distribution, which can only run Docker on a read-only file system. You're not trying to do distributed orchestration or anything like that. You're just trying to evolve your current thing into something that's more modern and which, is, which enables you um, to, do, to run this stuff in the future. So I'm going to just take, take two examples from, from Shopify, and one, one that we did right and one that we did very wrong. This is the one that we did somewhat right, um, which is secrets. A lot of people nowadays, when they do secrets for their applications, is they have a configuration management layer like Chef or Puppet, distributed files to all the servers with the secrets they need, the application boots, read the, reads the secrets, which is a very asynchronous model. And if you followed it before, what we're really trying to do is, is think of this as a binary. And secrets having as an asynchronous model with a file on system just doesn't work very well with containers, because it means you have to now have like a secrets container with a file system that's linked into every other container, or somewhere like have a, have a bind mount from the host into every container where it can see files. And it just gets very, very iffy and complicated and really not something that I would recommend trying. So secrets should either live in the image or be requested externally. Again, you, you're allowed in a container world to do IPC over the network. That's completely fine. And, um, but you could also just put it in the image. Obviously, you shouldn't be putting decrypted secrets inside of your images because you want to share the same images with your developers and your, and your, C, and your CI and so on uh, down the line, um, which means that they need to be encrypted when they're in the image and decrypted when they, when they boot up in the different environments. So we built something for that, and it's called eJSON, which is basically encrypted JSON. So you have in every in every repository, you have a .ejson file, which has all the secrets laid out in plain JSON, uses asymmetric encryption, so all of our developers have a public key, can encrypt those secrets, and it all lives, lives with, the, with, the, um, with the application. So when we build a new container image, the, the secrets are in there, they're encrypted, and when we start the container, we de decrypt them with our custom init process. Now, because of things like custom init process and um, they're being still stayed on the file system and so on. This is not really an ideal solution. I feel that what, what the community needs to move towards is somewhat of a secret broker. And this is one of the problems that I have been extremely surprised that the community, that I haven't seen more solutions to in the community. Um, HashiCorp recently released a really, really interesting new project, which is called Vault. And it has, uh, it's basically a secret broker. So your containers can, when they start, they can ask this container, hey, like, give me this secret. Uh, for example, for, uh, it could be for EZ2. Give me a secret for EZ2 uh, or S3 or whatever. And it even has the concept of leases. So what you can do is you can request a, se a secret, and then after five to 10 minutes, you have to refresh your lease. This means that ideally, you can actually move towards secrets where every single container has its own, view, its own secrets entirely, and they constantly expire, which is any security person's uh, wet dream. And so the, another example uh, is, is logging. And this is an, an example of where we completely failed and got ahead of ourselves. We, um, we didn't really honor the, the container uh, principles where, um, where you, shouldn't, you shouldn't put state inside of your container that lives for an arbitrary amount of time after the container has died. So we, we decided, OK, we're going to take a shortcut, and we're going to continue log into files just like we've done before. And then we will have another container reach into the file system, every other container, and then take the logs and send them off to our Splunk server, which in retrospect is, is an embarrassing way of thinking about it. Um, but that is, that's what we did. And we thought that that would be a great shortcut to do. Um, and one of the big problems here is really that the vendors haven't caught up. We, we have Splunk, and um, for anyone else who uses Splunk, like, it's paid for. Um, and uh, they, they just haven't caught up yet. They haven't figured out how, how to do Docker I, um, yet. So we have to build this stuff ourselves. So what we're doing is our, all of our containers are logging to files, and we have that container that's reaching into all of them. And this brings, because this violates the container paradigm so deeply, it brings a lot of issues with it. Like, when a container stops, Really, the right way to do it is that when the container stops, it's no longer there. You can delete it straight away. Docker has a flag for it uh, where you can do dash dash rm, and then the container is gone. But when you're doing logging, you can't really do that, because what about the last login lines, just these few milliseconds before the container stopped? You still want these logged. 
So you've got to keep it around for some arbitrary amount of time that you think is enough for your Docker de or uh, your uh, logging daemon to pick up the logs from the files. So now you have to have a sidekick process, another sidekick container that is looking at all the other containers and then deleting these containers off disk after a minute or five minutes or 10 minutes, um, which is just a complexity that you definitely don't want. This is getting better. Um, and really, like most of the issues that I'm talking about with Docker, um, there's always an upstream issue. And it's usually been discussed for about a year. But development does move a little bit slow. In 1.6, they finally introduced login drivers. And this means that now with, with Docker, you can, um, you can write drivers and kind of log to where you want. Um, in our case, we would love to log directly to Splunk or directly to Kafka or something like that. The problem, though, is that if you want to have your, um, if you want to have your custom login driver in Docker, you basically need to either fork Docker or um, contribute it to core and go through an extensive review process. And this really sucks uh, because a lot of people are doing a lot of custom things, and you, like, you're not going to get your s strange logging scheme that you have found to be effective for your organization merged into upstream Docker. Only if you're really, really lucky or you're OK with going through and violating a lot of that and changing a lot of that stuff in this stage. Uh, fortunately, what Docker is now looking towards is going to sort of an extensibility sensibility model where you can hook into the daemon and do and add in plugins at runtime. But for logging, that's still kind of far out. What they're focusing on for 1.7, which is scheduled um, hopefully this summer, is for uh, network and storage to be pluggable. But this is a really, really exciting direction. Uh, right now, there are many different solutions around uh, syslog, logging to, log to the network directly from the application, standard out, standard error. We're looking at standard out, standard error. Um, and then, um, yeah, we, we're still thinking about exactly what to do with logging, but it is something that we're working on right now. And once you're, once you're done with this, you, you have modernized some of your applications, some set of your applications. You've figured out what are the principles that we're going to adopt within our organization to be ready for Docker. You can finally get to the point where you can start actually using containers. Um, and maybe when you're at this point, Docker is no longer the popular container implementation, and then you just go with whatever. Fortunately, once you've done the things in stage two, it's actually really, really easy to move to another container implementation if you needed to. So what you need to do in this stage is um, get really confident with containers. Um, the, second stage, um, the second stage usually can, can take somewhere between uh, months to years for your organization, depending on what kind of structure. Are you going for a greenfield thing, in which case it will take less time? But you do still need to choose the technologies that you need for like logging secrets and so on. Um, and f some people can, step, can basically skip this step entirely um, if they start at a point where the cast solutions like Google and, and Amazon and so on are at a point where they solve most of these, most of these problems for you. So the, the focus of this stage is really starting to actually adopt containers. And as I've been, been preaching before, I do recommend starting with development and CI. And depending, depending on your stack, one, one might be face more of an immediate issue than the other. Uh, if you're already looking at completely revamping your development environment, environment, then that might be a good place to start. I think a lot more patterns are emerging in the development and CI environment about what to do with Docker. Uh, Docker Compose is something that the Docker Inc. team has built to um, manage multiple containers running at once and updating them and so on. There's still a lot of questions. Um, question kind of left unanswered of, for example, if you have, um, um, if you have multiple applications and um, you're tying revisions to each other. Um, so if you have service A and service B and you're, uh, you want to go into, um, you want to test service A against service B, which version of service B do you actually test against? And d Maybe, maybe you're using service discovery to figure out which, production, which SHA is in production. Maybe every time they deploy it, they go and change the SHA in every other one, which also sucks. But these are, there are still some unanswered questions here and there. But these are definitely very solvable problems for your team. And really, in this stage, it's, it's important to focus on the fact that you're just trying to introduce containers. You're not trying to uh, build crazy features or do, do something that you've never been able to do before. It's great if that comes out of it, but that shouldn't be your primary goal. You're setting yourself up for success for later. And maybe this is where you go into production, or, or maybe not. And this involves um, 
a bunch of things like you need to be able to you need to be really good at building container images. You need to figure out union file systems, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, init in a container is is also something that you might have to do. Monitoring, you might have to run edgy kernels if you're if you're running into uh, kernel lockups like we did. Uh, how do you do security updates? What about the Docker registry where you host all the images? How do you manage that? How do you scale that? Uh, how do you distribute? There's just a talk about deploys and how do you distribute all these Docker images because they're easily a gigabyte or multiple gigabytes large, um, and the way that the, um, the algorithm wor that works to uh, send over diffs over the wire is not very, very effective. And again, this is just as much about what it's, this stage is just as much about what it's not. So don't change orchestration, don't change your deployment, don't change Linux distribution, and if you're changing anything but, but containers, make a conscious decision to go back to step two, get it done right, and then move on. You're not in a rush. And so on some examples that speak to the immaturity of, of, of Docker, and these are one of tens, is um, running an init in a container. A lot of people just kind of shove um, their application into the container and then um, expect it to work. But really, because you're running in a completely isolated environment, you're expected to have an init process in there. A good init process um, that does everything that an init, an init process does. What, an init process, for example, can't crash. <laughs> because that crashes the entire namespace. But it also has the duty of cleaning up zombie processes. So when a, when a process dies in, in a Unix environment, it, leaves it, it goes into a zombie state. So the kernel puts it in a zombie state, and something has to acknowledge that, OK, it entered the zombie state, and now it's gone after you acknowledge that. And if you, don't, if you don't have an init inside your container that's doing that by waiting on all the children, then you can keep accumulating these zombie processes, which is common if you're like forking out and you have timeouts around that forking. Um, this, is, this is really a common scenario. And then you can exhaust a kernel data structure that stores all your processes, and your, your operating system acts in very, very undefined and, and interesting ways. And the other thing is building examples. We, at Shopify, we were not able to get Docker files to work at, at our, for our application at, at scale. So basically, we had to build image infrastructure completely from scratch. And this hasn't gotten better at all in the past year and a half, which is somewhat depressing. We have uh, about 1,000 to 2,000 lines that completely re-implement the, the, um, the image build system on top of Docker uh, to get our builds fast enough. We now have, have container builds in a minute, which is remarkable based, based on what we got. We, after a lot of work with Docker files, we finally got it down to around six minutes. But if you have requirements like being able to fix forward really quickly if something breaks, then you need to be able to build your containers quickly. And really what Docker needs to do is just expose these low-level primitives of building so that you can build your arbitrarily large and complex build system on top of it. But Docker files just sit at a very a very strange and uh, not great um, abstraction level because it doesn't enable you to do really great things. It just enables you to do very, very simple things. And the last one is, is union file systems. Uh, Docker needs kind of a copy on write file system because you're taking these massive images down on the server, and now you might be running hundreds of containers based off of that image. Instead of doing a copy of the entire image for every single container, you want to be able to share, share it and then do copy and write on disk. Um, and we tried a bunch of different approaches to this. We tried AUFS, which is one implementation of this, out of kernel. Uh, BetterFS is an in-kernel, completely new file system. And uh, ZFS is another approach, but on Linux it's still kind of sketchy because it runs in user land because of uh, licenses stuff, and uh, overlay is another completely new implementation of this stuff that came into the kernel. Um, we tried AUFS, BetterFS, and it, is, it was agony, like very bad. And uh, finally, we overlay came into the kernel, and that's been working remarkably great for us. So this is getting somewhat of a solved problem, but it just hasn't been very talked about. And in general, how union file systems work and how the build system works is, very, is not very, very uh, nicely exposed by, by the Docker documentation and really requires reading a lot of lower level documentation to understand fully. And once you're done with this stage, you can finally move on to the one that you've been dreaming about since you went into stage one which is where you start building really, really interesting features on top of this stuff. This is, what, this is the stage that we have finally reached where we get to the point where we can build, uh, where we can do CI in, uh, in five minutes, do deploys in three minutes, and start really building uh, infrastructure on top of this. But there's been a lot of, of really boring, daunting work uh, that came before this. 
This is where you can do things like distributed orchestration. Um, someone talked about Mises earlier today. That's one of them. Um, there's tons. There are so many companies building so many different ones. Uh, most of them suck, but some of them probably work. Um, this is where you start building Docker buttons for your developers. This is where you get a completely consistent deploy stack, where you have like an overview of all your applications, and you click on click on. Um, you have like little sliders to scale them up and down. This is where you really you you're able to build these things. This is where you might be experimenting with minimal Linux distributions, where you might be running Docker as init, and the only thing that the servers are running is actually Docker. Um, but this is not really a, a place that that we are at yet. So. Kind of in the end, I, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of problem with, problems with containers. And um, some of the problems are with Docker. Uh, I, just, I just got an email that we had like a memory leak on one of our job servers because of Docker was leaking memory. But the ma vast majority of our issues are really around the, just the Linux namespaces not being stable and the production tools just not being there yet. That said, we really believe in, we really believe containers is the future. And I think that the community has also realized this, that there's, there's just too much, there's too much, there, like there's too much talk about it. There's too many companies building on top of it. Like there must be something there. Maybe someone, maybe they haven't quite nailed what it is, but there has to be something there. And really what you should be looking at now is at least developing the, the mindset internally so that you know that you're building so solutions now that work for this when you have to adopt this in a couple of years. And Docker does have open issues for pretty much everything we've seen. There are some bugs here and there, but most of the bigger, bigger design decisions are already there and being discussed. But de development in core, unfortunately, is slow. I think really that what, what's going to be the next really interesting step and what hopefully will move us more towards production is when the extensibility gets into Docker core, where we can do like pluggable storage drivers, pluggable networking, pluggable logging, and so on. And Docker just, again, becomes that agreed upon interface. And really, the images becomes the core of the Docker community and how you build that. But again, the build system sucks currently. So they have to completely do the, uh, redo that. And um, unfortunately, I think the prospects for, for example, a new build system is is, are not great currently. So with that, um, I'll also be up here if anyone has more questions afterwards. Um.